and welcome to my podcast, Jack to the Future. From science and inventions to pollution and recycling, I talk about what's changing in the world, the future and how we can help with that. Every month I'll talk about a different future theme. For example, with the future of science, tech, sustainability, reading, with music and all sorts of other ones. The future of everything. This week's episode is all about the future of animals. We're very lucky to have Ranger Stew from Cedars Nature Park here to talk to us. I play a silly game with my mum and we think about what the animals might be like in the future. And I share other ideas and guesses from a channel I watch on YouTube called Brightside. Mum and I are going to play this silly game now and maybe we might predict what animals there might be in the future. You play it with two or more players. So the first person or player draws a head of a monster, an animal, then folds the piece of paper over. And then the next player folds it over, does the tummy and the shoulders and the arms, folds it over again, and you keep doing that until you get to the ground. It's my turn first. I've drawn a futuristic head. Well, I've put a monkey with sticky uppy hair, a squiggly head, and it's supposed to be a giraffe crossed with a monkey head. So my mum's going to draw the body and the shoulders. Okay, I'm going to draw some spiky shoulders and some long curly claws. Here we go. Hmm, sounds interesting. Now I'm going to draw the legs and the feet. So the legs look like human legs and the legs are yellow. They've got some brown feet with little bumps on either side of them for little ankles and they make him stand up properly. He doesn't have any toes but he has really long legs so that he can walk without toes. Now my mum's going to draw the surroundings and habitat of the animal before we finish. Now for the big reveal. That's really funny, that's really good. I really like the way the body looks like it has face on it, but actually there's a belly button and nipples on it. I'm going to call him Arf Monk Man because he looks like a giraffe, a man and a monkey. If you look at the artwork on this episode, you will see the picture that we made together. He lives in South Africa in the grasslands and lives in very big bushes and he's very shy. His shoulder bumps and his claws are important because he basically kills the animal with his bumps and then scrapes it up with his claws. And the really big nose is for great smelling its prey or other things that it wants to go away from so it can hide because I said earlier that it's really sharp. Why don't you have a go at playing this game with some of your grown-ups at home? Okay, listeners, today we've got our guest speaker with us, Ranger Stew from Cedars Park, and we're going to be talking about animals that can help us with things like science and technology in the future. Well, hello, Jack, and thank you for having me on. You're welcome. I'm looking forward to talking to you about some of these animals in the future. Sounds sounds pretty cool topic. So the first time I met you, I actually had no idea ever that I was actually going to interview you in the future when I was seven or three. Oh, well, thank you for having me on your podcast, Jack. I'm glad to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? So my name's Stuart, or Ranger Stew is what I call myself when I'm out with the animals. So what I do is I travel into schools and brownie groups and scout groups and nurseries, work with the Natural History Museum as well, and I teach children about animals. And I call myself an animal educator. So the animals come with me and it's all fun, but educational. And that's what I do as a day job. And then my other job is that I own a zoo called Cedars Nature Centre. And I co-own a zoo with Nick Spellman, who's the other director. And it's based in Wolfham Cross in Hertfordshire in a place called Cedars Park. And I know, Jack, that you you, you know Cedars Nature Centre because you've actually adopted an animal at my zoo, haven't you? Yes, I have. Yeah, She's it's... called Tallulah Tarantula. 
And she's not um, a species that will bite or anything. She's quite friendly, isn't she? She is. She's super friendly. I bring her out to the school visits, to the public at the zoo, and people can handle her. And yeah, she's never bitten everyone, anyone. She's a lovely, lovely animal. And thank um, you for adopting her as well, by the way, because actually that helps us uh, fund the zoo too. Hmm, you're welcome. Thanks. So the second question is, what's your favourite animal and why do you like it? My favourite animal is something called a tenric, and it's spelled T-E-N-R-E-C, and and it is a animal from Madagascar. And Madagascar is this amazing island off the coast of Africa, or well, quite far off Africa, actually. It has thousands of animals that are only found in Madagascar. So if you think of, you know, lemurs, they're uh, only found in Madagascar. And tenrics are only found in Madagascar. They have some relatives that do live in Africa. But essentially, tenrics come in all different shapes and sizes. And the ones that we have at the zoo are called lesser hedgehog tenrics. And we used to have a greater hedgehog tenric too. And so that tells you that they look a little bit like a hedgehog. So they look essentially just like a hedgehog. They can roll into a ball. They have spines. But get this, Jack, they are not related to hedgehog whatsoever. And uh, that's because they are in the same family, the Afroferans, as elephants. So they look like a hedgehog, but they are in the same family as elephants, dugons, manatees, hyraxes, golden moles. All the animals are weird names, okay? So uh, they they are amazing animals. I love them. Um, I actually keep them at home. Not so many now because I've got children of my own. But at one stage, believe it or not, I actually had 31 tenrics in my house <laughs> through three different species. So they are incredible animals. And I think more people should know about them. What do they actually do? What do they do? I know, what do they do for a hobby? Oh, so I'm not sure about their hobbies, but you never know. They might play a bit of football. You never know. Um, <laughs> Covergent evolution, what's called a niche, which is an area where an animal would live. And they've taken that niche where a hedgehog or an otter or a shrew would live, and they've evolved to take that niche. So what that means is that you get hedgehog tenrics, they look like hedgehogs. You get mole tenrics that look like moles, live underground like moles. You get shrew tenrics that look like shrews with little ta long tails. And in Africa, you get otter shrews, which are essentially the otter tenric, and it lives in rivers, hunts fish like otters. Cool. Tenrics. No, they're really cool. If <laughs> <laughs> Question number three. What animal might not be realised is endangered? Why? Can we do anything to help? I personally think that there is a massive group of animals that are very overlooked when it comes to conservation and it comes to people thinking about them, and that is fish. So fish aren't often thought about, are they? You know, we eat cod. A lot of people eat cod, fish and chips. Um, but that's an endangered species. And there's one animal in particular that I'm interested in called the European eel. And the European eel was once quite common, but now it's critically endangered. And this is a, a fish that people eat, you know, jelly deals. They eat them, you know, there's certainly more people eating jelly, jelly deals maybe 80 years ago than there is today. But people still do eat them. But the problem is, is that eels, European eels cannot be farmed. So what happens is, is they catch baby eels, they farm them. So they catch them out of the wild, they farm them. And then that's when they'll um, use them for food. So it's unsustainable. That is a species that we literally are just taking out the wild, rearing and then eating. And unfortunately, unlike other animals, you know, that can be farmed, eels can't. And I think... Believe it or not, around the UK, I believe there's nine marine conservation zones that just there for eels to save eels. So maybe there could be more conservation zones. You never know. A lot more people should really look at where their food comes from, maybe, and think especially about fish. Is, is my fish that I'm eating sustainable? Which means that if I eat them, am I endangering a species? Is there a better way I can eat them? Say if we take tuna and look at tuna, some tuna are caught in really bad ways where there's hundreds and thousands of them being caught at once well maybe you could choose a better option where lime caught tuna where they're caught one at a time so what i think we should do is is really look at fish and see where our food comes from and think about how that food got on your plate and whether it's sustainable yeah yeah my favorite one is definitely salmon is it becoming endangered yeah so some salmon is yeah don't forget, like I said, you can, they are farmed, but they are also taken out of the wild. And yeah, there's a really good website. I'm trying to think what it's called. Uh, the MSC, I think it is, where you can go on there and you can type in whatever fish you want to eat. Say you want to eat a salmon and it will tell you uh, whether it's between five 
and one on the endangerment scale or sustainability. And you can choose then if that's the type of salmon you want to eat. It's a good that's website. It's really cool. Um, yeah, I've been like, on there and checked out a few things. Yeah, I'd probably check out that website once we finish this podcast. There you go. Yeah, maybe your listeners can do the same, eh? Uh, okay. Um, what do you think the future of pets might be like and why? I think that there'd be less pets because I think, unfortunately, due to the way the human population is, there's probably people that will be living in uh, flats and smaller houses and that sort of thing. And we have such busy lives nowadays. I think that people will have less pets. There'll be less space for pets. So maybe, who knows, they may start getting more virtual pets. I know that lots of people like playing all these games on their phone and that sort of thing. When I was a child, we had Tamagotchis and Furbies. <laughs> and, what are they uh, like? It's a little, it does look like a little egg and it's got about three buttons on it. And you could have like a little digital creature that would be on your screen and you had to feed it and clean its poo up and that sort of thing. And I was obsessed. So I used to take it into school with me, which I wasn't allowed to do. And I got told off. Then do you know what I did? Uh, My mum had to then look after the Tamagotchi at home (laughs) whilst I was at school. Because if you didn't feed them, what would happen? They would die. I I wish I could have one. I think you still get them. Nowadays, there's so many games, isn't there, online where you could raise your own pet. You can... a zoo game um yeah as you said you could have artificial intelligence robot pets so then you wouldn't need to actually get them at all yeah maybe maybe you could have a robot dog hey you don't have to don't have to take it out for a wee in the middle of the night then do you (laughs) yeah i've got a dog my dog's called ralph or Ralphie, or Ra Ra, or Ralph Dog, whatever you call him today. He? Uh, he's coming up for 11 this year. He's blind, and his little eye sockets now are getting grey hairs as well. He's got grey feet and everything, so and he's getting he? old now, bless him. He doesn't have any eyes at all, no, so he's completely blind. What? You Why believe does he he's not blind, have any eyes? Um, we're not sure. So we rescued him. He was a street dog. He lived in Romania, yeah. and uh, he lived on the streets for about two years. And when we got him, he only had one eye. So um, maybe someone was horrible. Maybe he was born without an eye. We don't know. But um, his other eye, he had a glycoma in it. So he could only see about 5% vision in his other eye. I mean, it was a horrible disease that makes your eye sort of bulge forward. So it was quite painful for him. And we treated it for a few years. And then we just felt like it was better for him, you know, pain wise to have his eye removed. And I was really worried, Jack. I thought, oh, how's he going to get on? You know, but you would not believe he's blind. Honestly, he came back from the vets and he was running around. He jumps on the sofa. He's got his own little sofa, actually, a little dog sofa. And he's super spoiled. If my wife listens to this, she'll tell me off because I let him on the bed. I let him on the sofa. We got a brand new sofa. And I was like, he's not getting on there. A day later, he climbed on there. Yeah. You could just make a mini sofa for him. Make some sort of piston things. I don't know. That's a good idea. Like, you know, lift your sofa up when you press the button and then I can put his bed underneath. My son wants to be an inventor when he's older, so maybe he can start on that, hey? I really want to invent a portal gun. Wow, hey. that would be good. I mean, it'd be good for me visiting schools and stuff because at the moment I have to drive to them. So maybe I could fire a portal, get the animals, jump through the portal and be straight in the school, ready to set up, and I don't have to get up super early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which animals do you think global warming will most affect? What can we do to help? Global warming will essentially affect most animals on this planet, including humans. But most affect, I would say, the polar species. So animals that live in the Arctic and animals that live in the Antarctic. Because if you think of a polar bear, it has a large amount of space where it has to find its food. And it's able to find its food, which are things like seals and narwhals and um, other little creatures that live on the ice. Um, it's able to find that food because it's able to walk across miles of ice to find them. Um, And they can swim for miles too. But when the world warms up, that means that the ice is melting. And and that means that polar bear has to swim further to reach its food. But don't forget, desert species may have to adapt. They might have to get used to, to warmer areas. There may even be parts of the world where animals can't exist, where it's too hot. So, you know, lots of animals be affected. Things like corals in the sea. If the, if the sea warms up just by a few degrees, entire coral reefs will, will die. So, so, yeah, I think the way to reduce it is probably greener energy. We're all trying to reduce emissions at the moment. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to get a new car for my talks because when I drive into London to all the schools, my car isn't the best in terms of greener energy. So I have to get a new car, which will have better greener energy, which means that I can travel into London 
and uh, essentially not pay the the toll that you have to pay if you have a uh, car that isn't so <laughs> green. By legislation is changing almost like what happened in London. You know, people are forced to perhaps think greener. You know, we should recycle more. You know, there's only a finite amount of oil in this world and only a certain amount of trees on this world. And don't forget, um, cardboard and paper is made from trees. So wood is made from trees. You know, you look around and loads of stuff in our life is made from natural resources. So I think we all just maybe can do our bit. And I quite honestly believe that if everyone does a tiny amount of work then the world will improve Mm, yeah if the sea levels got higher would more fish be able to live or would maybe yeah maybe because there'd be more water on the on the land don't forget other species won't be able to you know so some species they they're used to if you think of a mangrove it's uh like shallow seawater and freshwater mixed isn't it and if the water rises it will get rid of mangroves and all those animals that have evolved to live in mangroves will die out unfortunately because the water of the sea has come in yeah i think if the sea level rise higher then it would be kind of closer to the sun and then the sun would heat the water up more and then the coral reefs Ooh. might might die that's and, right and on the coral reefs there's food and then the food will die so then the fish can't live yeah i agree yeah you said the spiders that were making some silk to help with sort of inventions in the future that's right yeah so a few years ago now i think it was in canada they combined spider dna with goats dna and they created not a spider goat no but um a goat that you can uh, milk and it has the silk within the milk so they can extract the silk from the milk i'm saying i'm almost rhyming here but you extract the silk from the milk and you can actually spin it to uh, create a organic thread that is seven to ten times the strength of steel which is pretty strong stuff and they're, they're kind of hoping to use that for lots of biological things so say human you know has a problem where they can't use their arm and they've got a tendon that's broken well they're hoping that they can use that sort of biological silk to create a new tendon in a human so how cool would that be hey that would be really cool uh, did you say that it would be like 10 times as strong as metal i think maybe they could use it if they wanted to make a metal frame or machine in a factory they could make it out of that instead that'd be really cool hey because they have tried in the past to take spider silk farm spiders for their silk but it just doesn't really work very well so the new next step is to milk a goat with silk although you probably wouldn't want to drink that milk would you from a goat if it's full of silk probably wouldn't be that enjoyable (laughs) yeah silk is is really precious don't know whether you know it's not the nicest process to get silk from a silkworm you have to get it from their cocoon they create they spin their their silk around themselves to make their cocoon and then they get the silk from the cocoon with obviously the animal insides even the process of making silk isn't isn't the best for an animal really you know mm. but um hope hopefully there can be some sort of conservation measure there to help them in the future hey mm. do you know what actually very quickly jack there's a thing that just crossed my mind about how animals can help us in the future did you know that there is a type of silkworm it's, it's the larvae of a silk moth that can actually oh. eat plastic so they've they've found a species that can eat plastic that'd be really cool because then you wouldn't after you've like recycled it loads and loads of times when you don't really need it anymore you can just give it to that and then it will eat it up for you there you go and do you know what then you could save them as well couldn't they imagine if everyone had like a, a silkworm colony in their house and you just sort of threw your threw your plastic in there and they ate that that'd be pretty cool hey yeah <laughs> how quickly do they eat it well i don't know because i know that they eat the plastic bags so oh i can't remember it's called maybe like polythene is that what it's called a plastic bag made from so they can eat through a very thin plastic bag but i'm not sure about hard plastics and that sort of thing really you know and there's some bacteria as well that they believe can digest plastic as well so yeah. who knows maybe the animals might be the future for us yeah maybe somehow you could make their bite be really strong so then it can bite and feel quite hard plastic yeah could imagine mixing the the goat silk that's 10 times stronger than steel attaching it to a wax moth's mouth <laughs> and then it loose on the plastic maybe maybe that's the future hey yeah. <laughs> there's millions of species on this earth and there's there's species that are going extinct before humans had even discovered them okay so there's millions and millions of insects on this earth and um i think maybe some of those animals that we're destroying may even hold the key to some of our problems yeah who knows okay 
Can you predict any animal species that might appear in the future? There's a really cool book called After Man, a zoology of the future. So if you ever are able to find this book, I found it in a charity shop and it blew my mind. And it talks about animals that might evolve in millions of years. So if, if humans were to die out, what would happen? What would evolve? Um, and there will certainly be less species in the future. Unfortunately, as, as humans, more of us are on this planet. Um, habitat loss is the major threat to most animals on this planet. And if you reduce the habitat, then species will die out, unfortunately. And what might happen? happen is the animals that live in urban areas so say like foxes and cockroaches and rats and all these animals that have uh, uh, adapted really well to humans living with humans maybe they will start to evolve to have different traits and if you ever read this book it's like crazy because some of the animals are like really crazy in there there's like a land octopus and that sort of thing but um but i i think maybe some of it could be a little bit true and maybe things like rats if, if humans were to die out and you know rats are all over the world on every continent well then they're going to start evolving in different ways and maybe some rats evolve to be carnivores and get a bit bigger and maybe look a bit like a meerkat but with rat teeth uh, and they hunt prey uh, maybe some of the rats become big and you get rats, I don't know, the size of antelope or that sort of stuff. Maybe you get foxes that get as big as dogs in the end. And maybe foxes that get smaller and can get into the houses that humans have left. Who knows what the future holds? But um, I think it's quite fun thinking about how animals can adapt. Yeah. Well, what about if, like, if it accidentally ate, I don't know, our DNA or something? Ooh, yeah. It could have our own DNA, it could be able to talk and do stuff. Yeah, I often think, imagine if most of the dinosaurs didn't die out, because I don't know whether you know this, Jack, but there are dinosaurs still alive today. Is the theropod dinosaurs evolved into birds. So every bird you see is a living dinosaur. Absolutely true. So in science, they call dinosaurs non-avian birds, which means non-bird birds. Really weird, OK? When I say if the majority of dinosaurs didn't die out because birds are still around, then maybe, who knows, maybe some of the dinosaurs over millions of years could evolve to have become intelligent enough as humans. And there may have actually been dinosaur humanoid things, hey? A bit like yeah. Doctor Who, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, pterodactyls, are they quite common? So uh, pterodactyls were uh, not a dinosaur. So they were a flying reptile. I believe they were quite common. I don't know, but um, you see pigeons quite a lot. So maybe pterodactyls evolved to be pigeons and they came oh. common. Well, imagine this then for the future. Imagine pigeons are another bird that's very good at adapting to humans, isn't it? So they're found all over the world now and they lay their eggs in the wild, by the way. Pigeons will lay their eggs on cliff edges. But as we have lots of towns and cities, what are our cliffs? Buildings. So they lay their eggs on buildings instead. And so who knows, maybe if humans were to disappear, maybe pigeons would evolve to become, maybe there'd be like an ostrich pigeon that would run along down the street and uh a uh, pigeon bird of prey that would hunt these urban foxes. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> or even they could eat our DNA instead. Uh, oh. and, and then they could have all the food they wanted. <laughs> Maybe they'd grow steel beaks and could break open the cans of beans in our cupboards and become, I don't know, baked bean eaters. <laughs> <laughs> or instead, their beak could eat fire and they could make a campfire <sighs> and then they could eat burnt marshmallows <laughs> <laughs> or they could handle really hot stuff like really hot chilies and then they wouldn't just... well, did you know did you know jack most birds can't taste chili they can't taste the heat of a chili no so most birds can eat like the hottest chili on earth and they won't be going <laughs> as it's really hot <laughs> maybe we could find a way to get that piece of dna and put it into us and then <laughs> and then we could go to the chili <laughs> festival and have the world's hottest chili and be absolutely fine. Yeah, that'd be a crazy, crazy thing to do, hey? Maybe that's the future. Maybe we'll all get bird tongues. Uh, what's your favourite animal? Definitely a tarantula. Normally people are really creeped out by them. I actually kind of find them cute, like, I don't know why, but, you know, mice are quite kind of furry. I, that's the I think, same with the tarantula. Yeah, I hear you. I think mean, that's right. I think sometimes when I meet people that are scared of spiders, yeah. sometimes I'll put the tarantula on their hands, you know, mm. once when they're ready to. Yeah. And uh, they're not very scared of tarantulas because spiders are very quick and small and tarantulas are quite large and hairy and slow. And I think to some people, they almost feel, I've had people say, well, it's more like a mouse. 
Oh, well, thank you for having me on your show, Jack. I enjoyed it very much, and thanks for being here. Oh, thank you. If you don't know about our Zoom, it is called Cedars Nature Centre, and it is based in Hertfordshire. And uh, we're very small, but we have lots of cool animals like tarantulas and armadillos. And we have a very strange creature, two of them, in fact, called zorillas. And it's not a zebra cross gorilla. It is a, uh, like a long, thin, skunk-like creature. Um, we're one of only two zoos in Europe with them. And so, yeah, we have some pretty interesting animals there. Also, if you're interested in what I do, uh, you can follow me. Hashtag Ranger Stew. Thank you. Take care, guys. Bye. If you have any children or if you are children, I really recommend you to go to his website and see his videos because they're really interesting. And I think my favourite one was probably with one of the reptiles. I watch a YouTube channel called Brightside and it talks all about sort of futuristic animals, inventions and technology. I watched a video and read an article about what they thought about the future of animals and humans. They predicted all sorts of animals would evolve or emerge in the future. I've chosen three to talk to you about. First of all, the night stalker. It is the front leg walking a leaf bat. It has sharp teeth and curly claws. So number two. So number two is a terabyte and some of you may have heard of a terabyte before, but it's not something on a computer. It's something that looks like an insect and a termite. It'll be a new species in 200 million AD. They have special chemicals in their mouth that they will shoot at their prey. And the last one, probably the hardest to say, is the Neosideris Schwartz and Hegeri. It's a basically a giant creature that looks like a spider, but it evolved from starfish and sea urchins. Um, I really like tarantulas, but probably wouldn't want to come across that in the sea. <laughs> I'm not sure if I want to be an entomologist in the future. Hmm. Of course, the other species that may evolve is us, humans. Belly buttons may not exist in the future because a baby could be 3D printed instead. We might be hairless because we wouldn't need hair anymore really because, well, we have coats and radiators. But in the Stone Age times, they had Stone Age people had lots of hair, didn't they? Boys and men, they no longer have nipples because they aren't used to feed babies milk. Maybe the future of humans can be another theme of my podcasts. Which body parts in the future do you think we will lose or keep and why? Okay, dear listeners, that's the end of our show today and hope you enjoyed the questions and what the Ranger Stew has to say. I really enjoyed this week's episode. It was so much fun. I'm not sure if I'd like to find out what animals would be like in the future. Maybe a bit ugly and a bit scary too. <laughs> Join me next time for another exciting episode of Jack of the Future.